church, let's stand and worship together. Sing about the generous God that we serve. Sing, you've spoken our hearts, began to be. Gave us breath and air to breathe. You've spoken our hearts, began to be. You gave us breath and air to breathe. It's all from you, Lord. It's all from you. You give the morning. You give the morning. The sun is light. All that we need. Your it's all from you, Lord. It's all, it's all from you. With humble hearts, we thank you. With grateful hearts, we sing out. Oh, generous. Your love came and set 
eyes of peace Oh, hear your cry to you we sing Come thou fount of the sea No to grace I pray the dead earth Oh, take me out and come straight to me Lord, let thy goodness with us. Thanks so much for worshiping together with us tonight. Let's step across the aisles and make each other feel welcome today. Sing you what church is called Unstoppable God. We serve an unchangeable, unmovable God. Amen. We're going to sing about that tonight. We sing along, sing faith commanded. Faith commanded, and the mountains of full fear. Fear is a losing ground to our hope in you. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name. God's kingdom reigns unstoppable, and let's sing of that tonight. Do with us nothing. And nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. 
your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable, unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on. Nothing shall be impossible. Nothing. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. We serve an immovable God tonight. Say amen. Thanks so much for worshiping Gilead. You may be seated. Let's open our Bibles tonight to 1 Timothy and join 1 Timothy 6 chapter, our key verse for this study. And uh, let's bow and pray and ask the Lord to bless his word. Join with me in prayer. Father God, we come before you this evening, Lord, thanking you that nothing is impossible for you, that you are going to bring about your plan in our life. And you're going to turn our lives into something that creates good works to bring glory and honor to you. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being used in your plan and your program. And uh, Lord, may we take proper assessment of our life tonight as your word is proclaimed. And may we agree wholeheartedly with you so that you can do a work of grace in each and every one of our lives. We pray in Jesus' holy name. If you pray with me, church, say amen tonight. Amen. In 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, our key verse for this whole study, it says, command those who are rich in this present world, that's all of us, we're all the one percenters, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. Boy, it changes in a day, doesn't it? Which is so uncertain but instead to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Aren't you glad that our God provides things for us so that we can enjoy life, amen? amen. And, and Christians should be the, the greatest enjoyers of life. He then says, command them, us one percenters, to do good. To be rich in good deeds. This is, our, this is what we're studying tonight. We're to do good, to be wealthy, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, by doing good with our wealth, in this way, we will lay up treasure for ourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. So that they, that's us, we may take hold of the life that is truly Life. Tonight I want to talk to you about being wealthy in works. Now we've already taught, we've already learned that being wealthy or rich, we've defined that as having more than we really need. How many of you in, in this room, will you admit that you have more food than you really need? Say amen. amen. Okay. How many of you have, even as cold as it is, you have more sweaters than you really need? Amen. amen. Not quite as hearty on that one. Okay, we, we, maybe you need, need to look at your closet and drawers. Oh, yeah, pull it. I haven't worn that in 15 years, but we have it still. Because why? We have more than we really need. And that defines us as being wealthy and, and in the position to do some. So in tonight's message, we're going to move from the why, is what we talked about, why we should be generous, why we should live generously on Sunday, to how. And so tonight, we're, we're going to put... Take this concept of living generously and we're going we're gonna to put it in our hands, if you will. We're going to put something in our hands that we can put to practice. Now, the reason we want to do that, because in this verse that we just read in 1 Timothy 6, it says, if we do this, the last part of the verse says that if we are wealthy in good works, if we take this concept and not only believe it in our hearts and minds, but we put it into practice and how we interact with others, 
What does it say? It says that we will take hold of the life that is truly life. So in other words, the Apostle Paul writes here that there's a difference between living and truly or really living. He said, no, if you do this, you're really living the life. There's a difference between that. There's a, everybody that has breath in the lungs, they're living. But if you're like, hey, man, are you really living? And they'd say, well, I'm, you know, I'm getting by. And this verse tells us why. Because we live in a society and we live in a culture, not just in America, it's worldwide, that is consumer-based and self-based. And basically, we live in a culture that says, the more that I get to consume, the better my life is. And it's not true. Because we consume more and more goods as a percentage, and we're less and less content and happy and filled with peace than ever before in our nation's history. So that's not true. The mindset of the world is not true. The mindset of God, though, says, as you are generous in your good works to others, we will truly start living. It says that's where the life is. And so the question tonight that we're going to answer is how wealthy are we in good works? And why are good works so important? Well, there's a principle. And let's look at the principle. It's found in Ephesians, the second chapter. And the principle is this. God saved us by them, right? Good works. I just want to see if anybody's listening today. Did, did God save us by good works? No. He didn't save us by good works. He saved us for good works. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace that we have been saved through faith. This is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God. We're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God. We did nothing to earn it. Can I get an amen? It is, and, and what is grace? It's God just pouring out his love and favor on people that are undeserving of it and people that can't do anything to earn it. Us, the recipients of the greatest love in the history of the world is what? What Christ did on Calvary's cross, paying the debt for our sin and offering to us anyone who will just believe the free gift of eternal life. We're recipients of grace. I did nothing to earn it. I did nothing to deserve it. In fact, I didn't deserve it. And he goes on to say, not by works. It's, it's not because of something I did. So that no one can boast. Instead, what is it? It's a work of God. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus by this grace through faith in order to do what? To do good works. God didn't save us by works. He saved us by his work on Calvary's cross. But he saves us by his grace in order for us to show out with our life through good works that Jesus is real on the inside. Amen. That this is not just words. It's not just something that we do on Sunday and really good Christians do on Wednesday. You're, you're the really good crowd. It's, it's what he saved us for. So what this means is, and read, continue reading Philippians, I mean Ephesians 2.10, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So what this means is that there was God's advanced priority before we were even made. He had predetermined that we were going to reveal him after we came to know him through salvation. He already has a design and has a plan in the every believer's life for us to show through our good works, who Jesus Christ is and what he did for others too. Now, this is where we get what the world is looking for. What is that? Our significance. Our significance. Everybody in the whole world is looking for that. Say, so what do you mean? They're looking how to be, there isn't a young person in the world that isn't looking to be unique. That's why they all go get pierced and get tattoos. Because <laughs> they want to be unique. Because no other young person is doing that, right? Yeah. So when I was a young person, I wanted to be unique, so I grew, ready, long hair. Right? Because why? Because there wasn't any other young people in the 70s growing long hair. And some of you are like, what's the deal with long hair? Is it because he's bald? No, you've got to understand, when I was a kid growing up, my haircut consisted of and then they would leave a little bunch right there. Okay? Or then... 
maybe they'd let it grow out to an inch and give you a what is known as a crew cut. They would just flat top it right off the bat and you would, your hair would be one inch tall, buzzed on the side one inch tall. That, that was the equivalent of hairdos when I was a kid growing up. Everybody had them. And then we bought into this thing called self-fulfillment and the uniqueness of the individual. And so guys were like, hey, I'm not going to cut my hair. In fact, when I do get my hair cut, I'm going to go to the girl's salon, not to the barber shop. We're going to go get our hair cut at a unisex place. That was absolutely scandalous in the 70s for you to go to a place where girls get their haircuts. Okay, and you're like, Are you, you're just making this stuff up. Oh, no, I'm not. And let me tell you, here's what's funny. If you look at Christian, I mean, at country music singers today, what's the uniform? They wear tight jeans, like grotesque tight jeans, men, and they have long hair like girls. And when I was a kid growing up, country music used to sing against tight pants and men with long hair. You remember that country music? Is that so funny? And so now the country music stars are like fulfilling, you know, I mean, Hank Williams would have never put up with that. Okay? Say, what does that have to do with the message? Absolutely nothing. I was just enjoying myself for a minute, okay? All right, so what God has designed, though, is what? You're not going to get significance through this individual. You can't get any more individualistic than fulfilling what God has designed before you were ever made, what role you are going to play in his grand design. You are going to fit into this massive masterpiece that God is painting from heaven. And he has a specific role for each and every one of us to play. And that's where we get our significance from as we fulfill this plan and it's what? It's a God-designed to-do list that each and every one of us are uniquely made for. Here's the cool thing about it. No one else on the planet or at any other time was made to do the job that you were made to do. Is that not cool? And you say, well, if I don't do it, someone else do it. No, it's going to get undone. God's not going to equip somebody else. He has equipped you to fill your function within the body of Christ, and only you are uniquely qualified, and you live in this unique time period in history. He decided your birth date. He's already predecided your death date. He has a specific plan and a time limit for you to fulfill his purpose. You do. We have somebody in church that's, uh, her name's Cheryl, and uh, she's got a brother that's dying down south. Uh, so I spoke with her this week, and she said, Pastor, I want you to pray because I, uh, I'm going to go see my brother, not, not sure that he knows the Lord. And, uh, and so we, we prayed, her and her husband and, and myself, and actually I think Craig was there too, and we, we held hands and we prayed together. And, and I had no problem praying. You know why? Because I know that God has a design, a, a, a unique design, and she's going to get there, and he's going to put his words in her mouth, and it's going to be exactly the way God wants it to be. Amen. Because why? She's willing. She's willing to be used. And that's the only thing that holds up this process, is whether or not we're willing. But since we're wealthy, we show there's no reason for us not to be willing because God's already taken care of us. He just wants us to show how good he is to others. So there's four things I want to talk to you about, about this what makes us significant and, and what brings significance to our life through these good works because God has designed us to do this. He has designed us exactly for a specific purpose. The first thing is, because there's some parameters about these good works. We, we shouldn't just you know, do, do like the cartoon characters and go running off in four different directions at once and expect God's plan to be done. No, we, we need to do it according to God's word. The first thing, and we need, to think, that we need to understand about our good works is my good works point to God, not us. When they're the good works that he's talking about in 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, it means that these works are designed to point the people that are 
on the receiving end of these good works, to point them to Jesus, not to us. A lot of the good works that happens in our world, it's so that men and women can what? Take the credit for it. So that the attention goes on the individual. Our good works are to point people to him. Because he's the one that did the work in our life and made us rich. Amen? And so what we want to do is point through our works. We want everything that we're doing to point people to the God that did this great work in us. Matthew, the fifth chapter, talks about this. Verses 14 through 16, he says that we are the light of the world. A town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. And neither do, do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. You don't hide a candle. If you're illuminating a house, you don't hide it. No, you, you put it. Instead, they put it on a stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others that they may see, ready, your good deeds, your good works, and glorify your Father in heaven. If what they're seeing, the good in our life, is it, if it's to give credit to us, we're pointing people into darkness. We're pointing people to lostness. We're pointing them to judgment. Because I can't save anybody. But if my works, my good works on behalf of God, them being the recipients, if they point them, if I give the credit to God, if they know, I know this is not you doing it, Oh, you're right, because let, let me tell you, left on my own, I wouldn't do anything like this. But God did, God wanted me to do this for you because he wants you. And then it says they will what? Glorify your father, which is heaven. Now, what's the greatest way for man to glorify God in heaven? To let him save us. That's his whole work. And so what this means is my good works should be tied into this person coming to understand the good news of Jesus Christ. They should always be tied in with the good news getting into their life. And so as I open my life through the word, you know, a good word for it is acts, of, a good phrase is acts of kindness. This, is this stuff that people aren't deserving of, that, that there's no design for, it's just God moving on our hearts. We do that to reveal Jesus. Let me give you an earliest example of my life to this. I was a typical kid when I was growing up, even though I grew up in a pastor's home, typical kid, uh, very much did not want to spend eternity in, in hell. And if I grew up in the South, that's two words, hail, right? But I, I grew up in the North, so it's one word, hell. And, and so as, as a little boy, I, you know, would sin, get in trouble, and God convicted my heart. I made a decision for Christ and, and trusted him as my Lord and Savior. But there was tons of work to be done and uh, a lot of setbacks in the process. So when I, when I became uh, about double digits, maybe about 10 years of age, I started you know, doing lawns. And we had a next-door neighbor that was an angry cuss of a man. And he was actually an iron boat captain on the Great Lakes. He would, he would captain these, uh, those big iron ore ships from up north through the locks and down here to the plants to make, you know, for the furnaces to make steel and, and uh, glass. And uh, he didn't like kids. And so, I, I, I mean, he was, he was mean. A ball go in his yard and you'd never see it again. I mean, it was like that ball went to see Jesus because, I mean, the captain, I don't know where he put him, but boy, you never saw it once it went over. If you, you know, I, I lived on the corner and he was the second house in. If I were to cut across his lawn running and he were to see it, boy, he'd come out and there would be a conversation. And usually his words would have a lot of choice words I can't say in here. And, uh, and, 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 that's just the kind of guy he was. He was this ornery, mean man that just didn't like kids. My mom would, on a regular basis, witness to his wife. They were older than my parents uh, by quite a bit. And he was retired. And uh, so one spring, uh, my dad and mom sat me down and said, Tom, we, we got a ministry idea for you. And I was like, 
okay, what's that? And they said, well, we think you should mow the captain's yard. That's what, that's what everybody called them, the captain. We think you should mow the captain's yard. And my first thought was like, well, number one, no. And my second thought was very similar to the first one. And it was second thought, heck no. He's mean. I don't want anything to do with the guy. And they said, listen, Ma, Mom's been talking to his wife. God's softening her hearts. And, and we think that, you know, we've been praying about them. And, and we think you're the way into this guy's heart. I'm like, he doesn't even like me. Yeah, but you're going to do this thing. You're going to cut his lawn. And you're going to let him tell you exactly how to do and this and that. And you're not going to take a penny for it. And you're going you're to serve this man. And we're hoping that that is going to lower his the hardness of his heart, and that's going to give us an open door. And I was like, why don't you guys cut the lawn? I really don't want to, you know, I mean, but they, I, I think it was the 10-year-old factor, and so that this big-eared kid, the preacher, big-eared preacher kid next door, he started cutting. First of all, I had to go over and say, uh, Mr. Captain, uh, my parents sent me over here, I'm going to cut the lawn. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, he said, well, they just want me, well, you can do it, but you got to do it. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. So he stood out there like a drill sergeant every time I did it. And I cut that lawn. I edged it. He had the old kind of driveways. It wasn't solid. It was the two paths of cement going all the way back to the, uh, to the garage. And I had to edge every one of those things every time I cut it and sweep it. We didn't have those electric blowers. Oh, God, if I, I would have just... Died it went to heaven if I had an electric blower when I was a kid. It was a broom, baby. And a uh, broom, and then you had, I mean, it was, it was a lot of work. I mean, it would take a half a day to do the captain's lawn the way he wanted it done. And after a couple times, I looked at my parents, and I got to be truthful with you. I was looking at them, and I was like, you guys are crazy. There's going to be no payoff. He's a mean, he doesn't even say thank you. And, man, I get... I get more smiles from the people that pay me to do it. And I had other customers. I had paying customers. And they, they treat me nicer than him. I'm doing it for free. This is crazy. And they said, no, just keep doing it. God's going to do work. God's going to do work. God's going to do work. Over and over again. God's going to do work. And you say, did it happen overnight? Hmm, I wish. But it didn't. I cut that man's lawn for about four years until the day we moved over to Taylor. Until I was 14 years of age. Until I was 14 years of age. And, at, and when we moved, they sat there in, on the sidewalk and watched us drive away. And the captain and his wife wept big crocodile tears when we moved. And on a visit back to see them, the captain got saved. He got saved. Now, why did he get saved? I think he got saved because he saw somebody do different to him than the rest of the world would do. I think the world gave him hardness back that he gave out. That's what the world does. We got to show the world somebody different. Amen. Somebody different. And listen, as my parents were helping me to see this, because I didn't see it, I was like, this is crazy. It's not going to pay off. Well, let me tell you, the day he moved... And I got him in my drawer, my top desk drawer. He gave me his eagle emblem that he wore on his captain's hat and the things that he wore on his shoulders. And he gave them to that rotten kid next door. Probably the most prized possessions of his life. He gave them to me. Amen. But better than that, he gave his soul to Jesus Christ just because I cut his lawn. That's it. I'm going to tell you, at that stage of my life, I was designed to cut lawns. I loved going and cutting lawns because those people would give me money to do it, and I was just very motivated. I was good at it. Okay? And you're designed to do something. God has, I mean, God has designed you to fit and to witness and to give kindness to people in a very unique way. And when you see that coworker or this or that going through something, meet their needs and act, give them an act of kindness the way God has designed you to do it. Amen. God has designed you to do it.
Now, the example in this point is, is simply this. What, what if we could stick a stethoscope on the heart of Jesus? What do you think it would sound like? I've heard it said that it would beat others, 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 every beat. He's all about others, isn't he? And so that mindset that we grew up in, that the world, the, the curse, it, me, 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 it doesn't fit. This will only happen if we have the heartbeat of Jesus in our life, beating for others. So our good works should point to God, not to us. Secondly, our good works are samples of Jesus. Samples of Jesus. Who doesn't love going to Sam's Club on Saturday? Well, evidently, a lot of people like it because I see a lot of you there. And one of the main reasons is not just because of the day out, because on Saturdays, they put all those people out there with food samples. And, you know, when you find one of those food samples you like, you go around more than once down that aisle, don't you? I know I do. And let me tell you, you want to find Jack Smith on Saturday? He's at Sam's Club. You're just cruising the samples. Cruising the samples. He, he's talked about it, when he's, but he's not the only one that enjoys it. But this has happened to me before. I go into, go into Sam's Club, and, and, you know, the lady says, hey, would you like to try this? He hands you a little plastic cup, and I, I, half the time I don't even look. I, I don't only look till I see it, and I say, hmm, that looks interesting. Gulp, put it in my mouth. Oh, what is that? I can't tell you how many times. Well, it's this, and there's the product right there, and here's a big bag of it. And I go, two of them in the cart. <laughs> samples work, don't they? If they didn't work, they wouldn't be paying those people to give those samples out. They work. Just think how much product they give away in one day. Not as much as I can buy in one day. I know that. Because why? Sampling it does work. Well, we are the sample of Jesus Christ. Look at what Acts, the 10th chapter, verse 38 says. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Why did Jesus Christ go around doing all those things? He was giving them samples of who his father was. He was revealing. And when we give samples of love to others, samples of the goodness of God, the kindness, the graciousness, the mercy of God, we're giving them a little piece of God. Amen. And they might just take the whole bag if we would give more samples out. Amen? So we're the samples. Our lives are the samples. Our attitudes are the samples. And so my good works not only should point to Jesus, not us, but my good works are samples of who Jesus is. Number three, my good works go the extra mile to show God's love. Well, this is right out of Scripture. Matthew, the fifth chapter says, if anyone forces you, and this is on the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is talking to his disciples. He said, and the whole point of the sermon, he said, this is what's going to make you different. If anyone forces you to go one mile, Go with them two miles. So we have to understand the history of this. The, the example that Jesus is using, every Jew would be familiar with. They were under Roman rule, and Roman occupation. They were a conquered nation of the Roman Empire. And as such, the, one of the rules of the Roman Empire was this, that any soldier could take any citizen of a conquered nation and demand that citizen to carry his pack for a mile. And according to Roman law, that mile was 1,000 steps. 1,000 steps. That any soldier at any time could just say, hey, buddy, come here. Uh, I'm, I, I'm on my way to go cut a lawn. No, I don't care what you're doing. Here, take my backpack. You're carrying it with me for a mile. And they had to do it. And Jesus said, when they compel you to do that, don't carry it one, carry it two. Go beyond what is required to show them that you, didn't, that you weren't forced to do this, but that you were willing to do this. He said, go with them twice as far. And so what this shows people is that our good works are not a have to, but we get to. 
I get to carry your backpack for two miles instead of one. When you show the world that kind of mindset, first of all, they're going to want to know, A, are you crazy, right? Or B, if you're not crazy, what are you doing that for? Because why? The world never gets this. They never see this. They should see it from us. It's such an easy way to witness. People are always worried about, I'm worried about saying the wrong things. Carry their pack for two miles. It says everything they need to know. They will be asking the questions after that. Why did you do that? And let's not forget that without lifting a sword, Christianity overthrew the Roman Empire. Can I get an amen? amen. Oh, yeah. So much so that the, the main church became Rome. <laughs> okay? So let's not forget that. Okay? They won. Hands down they won. Because why? They went the extra mile. They didn't have to, but they got to do it. We have opportunity to show people that we love you. Now, I, wonder, I want to interject a little statement here. Because there's a lot spoken today about social justice. Say, Pastor, what do you think about social justice? I, I think that everybody deserves justice. Can I get an amen? amen? Everybody. Okay, but I'll tell you this. God's grace and mercy is greater than justice. Amen. Okay? And so... I think as Christians, the only justice that we can do is to give the good news of Jesus Christ to as many people as we can. That's doing justly. So here's the statement. To meet someone's need, a social need, but not point them to Christ, is like giving someone a slice of heaven without revealing how to get there. And that would just be plain cruel. To give someone a slice of heaven and say, but I'm not telling you how to get there. I'm not telling you how to get the whole cake. This is your piece. That's it. That's just plain cruel. And we don't want to be cruel, do we, church? We want to tie in our good works with telling people how they can get it all. So our good works point to Jesus, not to us. They're samples of Jesus. They go the extra mile to show God's love. Number four, my good works glorify God through his church. Through his church. Not through any organization that says, well, we're a Christian organization. No. Jesus Christ said, through my church. The church was made, created, and is sustained by the work of God. And it's Jesus that said, this is how my kingdom is going to be built. Through the church. A New Testament called out body of believers that follows the biblical um, requirements of what a church is. Now, why, why is this important? Because we live in a day and age where the church is becoming more and more irrelevant and Christian organizations say, hey, you, well, yeah, yeah, we're not really tied in church. We're just doing God's work. If you're doing God's work, you should be a church. Okay. You should be a church. Because why? Because Jesus in his word is the one that said, I'm going to do my kingdom through what? Through my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What? The church. Moving the gospel forward. I'm all about the church. I'm kind of iffy on the organizations that are outside the church. Why? Because they're not the church. It's that simple. I don't, I don't, I'm not mad at them. I don't hate them. They're just not the church. They're not the church. So they can't do what God has designed the church to do. Because why? They're not the church. It has to be a called out body of believers. Okay, now, I believe, and Scripture points this out, that the church is the only hope for the world. Since Jesus said, this is how I'm going to build my kingdom, then it stands to reason that we are the only hope for the world. And if we're the only hope for the world, and many churches don't see any converts in a whole calendar year, it stands to reason that we should probably switch things up a little bit. Can I get an amen to that? 
Because why continue doing what's not working and expect different things to happen? That's just crazy. And Jesus gave us a sound mind, sound body. Amen? So our good works glorify God through his church. The greatest example of this was the early church. And it was so unbelievably different that these people that just a few weeks earlier crucified Jesus, they could not deny the reality of what was happening in this thing called this New Testament church. They could, they'd never seen anything like it. And the world, quite frankly, has never seen anything like it since. So let's read it right from the original. Acts, the fourth chapter. It says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. With great power, isn't it amazing? With great, because they were living like that, they had great power, go figure. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who, were, who owned lands or houses sold them. It, it, it wasn't a rule. It said from time to time, there were people that just up and of their own volition, they sold land and houses, and they brought the money in from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Let me tell you, there's been governments that tried to do this. Socialism. The only problem is that it's never equal, is it? it, it what socialism means is they get to take yours and get to do with it what they want. That's, what social, that's not what this was. This was not communism. This was not socialism. This is, they had things in common. In other words, they had other people at heart. They had other people's needs at their heart. And this model right here is what put it over the top in Jerusalem. This is the one that glorified God, that the Jewish uh, Judaizers looked at these same people that called for the crucifixion of Jesus said, there's something to this because I've never seen anything like this before. This is just not normal. It's outside the bounds of normal. You just don't do this unless something else is at work. They were doing it together. And they realized that they needed one another. And they started looking at their lives differently and through a different scale and through a different thermometer. And Gilead has its heroes. We have women uh, in, in, in small groups and on their own. There's, there's nobody telling them they have to. On their own, they go visit group homes. My, my, my wife's group has, has gone to a, a girl's uh, lockdown facility and just and threw them a, had, a, had a pizza dinner and played games with them and, and uh, one of the ladies in her group said man I'm, you can mentor these girls and, and she signed up and she's mentoring one of these girls why she's, she's one of God's heroes here at this church that's what that is putting yourself out there for somebody not because you have to but because God's doing this work in your life and he's motivating us to do that He's motivating us. I mean, there's so many things that are going on in this. I, I remember a church member telling me, hey, you know what? Uh, and I, I was saying something, and, and they said, well, yeah, uh, I, I'd love to come to that, but that's when I, I go shopping for my neighbor. I said, what do you mean you go shopping for your neighbor? Oh, you know, my neighbor, they're infirmed, and their family really doesn't, isn't there for them. And so every week... I go to the grocery store and get all their groceries for the week, and I go to the drugstore and get all their medicine for the week, and I've done it every week. And how long have you been doing that? Oh, like 10 years. What? That's, that's what will get people to hear the message of Jesus Christ. That makes us one of God's heroes. Not a Gilead hero, but a hero of God. And each one of us are specifically designed to meet needs like that. You have something that you're great at, that no one else can do like you do. 
So whatever it is, whether it's bake a cake, cut a lawn, wire somebody's electrical, I don't know. But you can do it. And you can open the door to show them who God is through that. Through that. That's doing good. He says, I want you to be wealthy in good works. May we allow God to use us to make a difference. Why? Because people matter to God. They do. That neighbor of yours, that neighbor of mine, that was an angry cuss. I didn't realize that as a kid. I just wanted him to go away and leave me alone. But you know what my parents realized? The captain mattered to God. He mattered to God. Well, how do you know he mattered to God? Because Jesus died for him. He died for him and his wife. And I'm going to see them both. My first adult conversation with him is going to take place in heaven. Is that amazing? Just amazing. I, I got to believe that he's going to be one of the people that are really excited for when I get there. He's going to be really excited when I show up in heaven. He's going to be like, there he is, the lawn kid. Like, yeah, the lawn kid. Well, I'm not going to be embarrassed that I was the lawn kid. No, I'm not going to be, right? Because why? It changed eternity. It changed eternity. We can, this still works. It still happens. It still happens. The reason Rome was changed by Christianity is because too many of the soldiers that were killing Christians got tired of killing people that were praying for them and telling them, we forgive you for what you're about to do. <laughs> and the soldiers got on their knees and lined up with the Christians because they had never seen anything like that before. I said, this is not from this world, right? It's not. It's from God through us to glorify him. Amen. That's what good works are for, for him. We can do it, right, church? Amen. We can do it. You're sitting there thinking right now, man, I, there's that thing I do. I know you're thinking. You can do it. Now let's do it and give God the glory and change eternity one soul at a time. Amen? amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet. As you stand to your feet, just bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're standing here today and you're like, yeah, I'm a believer. I know Jesus. He lives within me. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, but pastor, I, I've allowed this world to infect my thinking. And Everything you said tonight, I, I totally, I'm, I'm there. I, I believe it. It's everything that I needed to hear. But I'm not living that way right now. I've let the world push me into its mold. I'm thinking about me and mine and, and what belongs and what others can do for me. Why this mindset is so contrary to the world that we live in. I know that. But maybe it's, it's jarred you tonight. And right before I pray, you would, you would admit, Pastor, I, I, want, I want you to pray for me right now because hey, my, my thinking's got to change. I, I want to be wealthy in good works. I want to give God the glory in my life. And I want him to use me to change eternity for somebody else. If that's your prayer tonight with heads bowed, would you slip your hand up and say, that's my prayer? Oh, hands all over. Upstairs too. Awesome. Awesome. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you. We love you because of what you designed when you sent your son to this earth to die for us and, and pay the price for our sin. And Lord, we are unworthy and we're undeserving of it. But Lord, we're so grateful that you did it. We don't understand it. And the only difference between us and, and, our, and our mean, crusty neighbors like the captain that don't know you is that we know you. That's the only difference. So, Lord, may we work, may we, may, may we be rich and wealthy in good works in order to show them who you are. Point them to you. Be samples of who you are. To show you that you love them. And to reveal that there is a different way to live this world and live this life. 
Lord, empower us, convict us. And as we say yes to your design, Lord, may we gather here bringing the sheaves of the harvest of souls with us. In Jesus' name, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if there's someone here tonight who would say, Pastor, but I, I, I'm not sure I know Jesus. I, I want to be wealthy in good works, but I, I haven't allowed him to do that work in me yet of forgiving me and saving me. And, and I, I want to ask him to do that tonight with your head bowed and your eyes closed. You've never done it before, but you, you want me to pray for you to invite Jesus in your life. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, I need you to pray that for me tonight. That's what I need you to pray. Just slip your hand up, upstairs and down and look across one time, okay. All right, go ahead and look up, church. Now listen, let's, let's sing this song together and lift our hearts and minds. Isn't it awesome what God has done for us? And we get to be the little samples. We, we don't have to live in a little plastic cup, thankfully. But we're the samples of who Jesus is. Let's sing together. Will shout your praise forever.